Alas, we must report that another back to school season has come upon us, and we muggles have not gotten our letter to Hogwarts. But since the 1990s, that infamous wizarding world has received plenty of howlers, not just from concerned Christians, but also from zealous fans and critics, and these days even sexual activists. One recent podcast, The Witch Trials of J.K. Rowling, brewed all of this into a bubbling cauldron of controversy. Now our own staff writer at Lorehaven, Marion Jacobs, who is crafting her own book about a biblical Christian worldview of fictional magic, appears in our studio to help teach defense against these dark arts. Welcome back to Fantastical Truth, the magical in a good way podcast from lorehaven.com in which we explore fantastical stories for God's glory. I meet Stephen Burnett, the publisher of Lorehaven and co-author of The Pop Culture Parent. This is episode 177, How Does J.K. Rowling's World Expose Legalism, Fandom, and Sexual Activism? Zach is on an away mission right now. Pray for him now. Uh, but Marion Jacobs is already in the studio. I'll just go ahead and say that she apparated in here completely uh, skillfully. She passed all her exams. Marion, great to have you in the studio again. Thanks. Great to be here. I have not splinched myself, and uh, I'm happy to talk about all this. Yes, that can get kind of violent, and this episode will not necessarily be violent, but if you listen to that podcast I mentioned, this is actually our first episode, by the way, talking about someone else's podcast, and they haven't paid for it or anything. Uh, it is a great show, though, and so relevant to everything that we talk about in Fantastical Truth that just seemed worth it to go into that podcast. We won't be playing clips or anything, but Mary and I have both listened to this series, and there is a trifecta of issues uh, that we're going to explore in this episode. First, however, we're going to stop by our top sponsor, Enclave Publishing, with their new book just released on August the 22nd. It's dangerous to be a pirate. Enclave Publishing presents Savage Bread, the highly anticipated final installment in the YA Pirate Fantasy Trilogy from author Victoria McCombs. The seas have become more threatening than ever, with enemies closing in on all sides. War isn't just brewing, it's here, knocking on their doorsteps, threatening to devour them all. And just as she was warned, Emmy might have been the one to create the chaos. But she's a pirate now, a pirate who will do what it takes to save her crew, even if it means oath-binding herself one final time. Savage Bread, the third book of the Royal Rose Chronicle series from Victoria McCombs, finishes that trilogy, and it is available now wherever fantastic books are sold. You can pre-order now online or ask for it at your favorite bookseller. Marion, I'm glad you're here. Uh, we're going to have a uh, full spread in the Great Hall at Hogwarts. We are muggles, but we did sneak in. Uh, I had a few concession stand items I did want to offer. I don't want to belabor too long here. But it is such a fraught topic, isn't it? And maybe you had some ideas about how to set expectations for listeners. First of all, I, I do want to say that we have had previous episodes more about the Harry Potter series itself. This one's a little different. It's more about the podcast, which is about the Harry Potter series, but it's mostly about J.K. Rowling and all the controversies, old and new, uh, that have swirled around her. So we're going to explore that series. The Witch Trials of J.K. Rowling uh, came out earlier this year, actually. And I was actually waiting for a while because they said they were going to do, it sounded like they said they were going to do another episode, but they haven't yet. So I figure it's complete. We can now talk about it. Uh, like Rolling, we're going to be careful here uh, to discern between victims and victimizers. There's a lot of talk about power and oppression and who is feeling hurt the most. So we're going to get into some emotional stuff here, kind of like how Marion and Laura McCary and I did in our previous episode about church trauma. The podcast, by the way, not this episode, I'm going to behave myself, Marion. I know you will. Uh, but the Witch Trials podcast includes gratuitous examples of gross worldviews and misogyny and vulgar quotes, uh, especially when people are getting mad and trying to hit each other with their brush fire words on the streets. Uh, it's not great. Just be aware. There's some really R-rated stuff in that podcast just from there the is. quotes that they're doing. Yeah. And they mean that to be uh, outrageous. Like they want you to hear exactly how toxic uh, some of the internet responses can get. Right. Three terms defined here. Legalism right there in the title. When we say that, we mean any unbiblical rules that people treat as biblical when they're not. And when we say fandom, we mean any group of uh, viewers or readers of a story who like the franchise. They dress up. They do uh, fan art. You know the rest. Uh, most importantly, maybe when we say sexual activism or the term I use is sexualityism for the religious and social beliefs there. 
uh, we mean this uh, newer political, religious, and social cause that really does prize the idea of human sexual autonomy and identity over traditional views of those things, whether biblical or just culturally conservative. So that's what I mean by that. There's some other terms I might drop, but if we need to, we will define those in any interaction from this show. Finally, this is part of our Back to Magic School series, so it's a little bit more philosophical, uh, maybe feels a little bit more educational. But even if you didn't get your letter to Hogwarts, uh, you got your letter to Fantastical Truth. We do think, I think, Marion, and I want to ask you about this. Um, how did you find that podcast, though, uh, The Witch Trials of J.K. Rowling? Just overall impressions of that before we head into chapter one here. Wow. You come away from each episode just reeling. Honestly, I did. I, I just felt, you know, I had so much empathy, so much insight into not only Harry Potter, um, J.K. Rowling, but just how these things came about, um, the, just the backstory of everything that we've seen already for, for a long, long time um, in the news. Any, any backstory is going to give you empathy, and this one definitely does. It does. And you empathize more with the characters of Harry Potter because you're getting to know the author of the series. And there's a lot of critics now who have literally said, J.K. Rowling is dead to me. She is no longer the author of Harry Potter, which is just a microcosm of rebellion against the created order. You're trying to literally erase the author of a franchise. That is just silly. Uh, it's a grandstanding, preening act of power that really doesn't even bear mentioning except that it's just so goofy i think i recommended this podcast to you because we had found out that you had signed for that new book the nonfiction book the scriptural analysis and guide to discerning fictional magic you had gotten a contract for that uh, and i believe you're aiming for a release date in summer of 2025 uh, that's from right. bnh publishing Without giving away your book uh, already in progress, I'm curious what you've gained from this podcast, The Witch Trials of J.K. Rowling, that has fed into your research for this project. Yeah, good question. I think I already was toying with the idea of possibly having like an, an entire chapter dedicated to analyzing Harry Potter. And I was like, is that really necessary? After coming away from this podcast, I realized I think it is necessary. I think it's it's such a phenomenon for our society. It's one of the biggest, if not the biggest, children's book has sold more than, you know, Narnia or any of those. It's such a huge question in people's minds. And and I really want to give voice to some of um, J.K. Rowling's concerns and intentions behind the book, too, without being too biased towards her. I, I definitely want to portray what the Bible says and how we can discern things through a biblical lens as that being my primary motive. Absolutely. We are using our Bible lenses now to discern not just the Harry Potter series and enjoy it, yes, for the good that's in it, uh, but also to engage the ideas that are in it that are not biblical. The wise, mature Christian can do both at the same time, but you can also do that with a fascinating personality like Rowling herself. And I think Mary and you and I uh, were both observing, even from a distance, uh, back in the, I guess it was actually the late 90s when it started, and nobody knew who this person, J.K. Rowling, was. But suddenly, here's this woman off in the UK somewhere who's written books where kids go off and practice witchcraft. And there were rumors and things about her herself being a witch. Uh, that's what the title of this other show uh, is alluding to, uh, that people are still treating her like a witch, but uh, decreasingly the Christian types and uh, more of the folks who would also disagree with Christianity. It's almost been a polar shift, as we've talked about on another show. But let's go to chapter one as we talk about the, these three ways that J.K. Rowling's world uh, exposes things. Uh, titled chapter one, that her fictional wizards uncloaked Christian legalism. So. Some of y'all still struggling with Christian legalism uh, in our faithful listening audience. Uh, this section is for you. We're going to talk about it a little bit here. And Witch Trials Episode 2 also focuses on this. But I would like to point out and ask you about this, Marion, that that episode to me seemed almost to a fault, balanced and even kind, I think to evangelicals who were afraid of the Harry Potter series or concerned about the Harry Potter series to try to follow their example and put that in a positive light. Uh, you know, they're, they're quoting from preachers at the time. Like, I think I heard a John MacArthur clip in there. There's a John Hagee clip in there mm -hmm. uh, talking about how Harry Potter is going to corrupt your kids and get them into the New Age movement and spellcasting and things. But the podcast itself was it, just like rolling 
was very kind. Like Rowling herself, for example, was behaving, um, at least now, I don't know how she felt then, but she was behaving jolly decent and saying, you know, I understand how people were getting alarmed about this because the Harry Potter series just got so big so fast. And even when she was talking about a bomb threat at one of her book signing events, she said that it was allegedly from uh, someone on the Christian right. Uh, they never found out that that was true. So she just seemed to take great pains to clarify that they didn't know who actually called in that bomb threat. Yeah. I, you know, I did feel like it went by way too quickly that the most of the podcast was focused more on current events. And honestly, I think that that they're going easy on you know, the Christian fundamentalists. Oh, okay. Um, was honestly maybe it's just a just a a symptom of time passing. Um, it seems you know, a little less dangerous and irritating now because it's old. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it po possibly, I'm guessing. You know, maybe she has. She, you know, J.K. Rowling herself is dealing more with current crises, um, and less with you know the Christian fundamentalists back years ago who were threatening her life and calling her a witch. But I do think that it, the problem was severe and continues to be severe, but it's not hitting the news. Right. It counts uh, for who is doing the podcast. I, I was less familiar with this host. I was familiar with the organization that put it together. It's called the Free Press, and it's started by uh, journalists and pundits, uh, mostly journalists like Barry Weiss, for example, was a New York Times journalist, but they kicked her out uh, for not being socially leftist enough, uh, despite the fact that she is an identified practicing married, put that in quotes, same sex attracted woman. Uh, she wouldn't call herself culturally conservative, but she's a fellow traveler with cultural conservatives just because she doesn't go in for the authoritarian cultural left type stuff. So she started this group called the Free Press. She seems to legitimately want to pursue objective journalism or as close to it as possible. And then the host of this podcast is actually named Megan Phelps Roper. The Phelps should sound familiar if you're keeping up with outrages in the early 2000s because there was a cult, uh, probably still around, but a little less in the news now, uh, called the Westboro Baptist Church. I put Baptist in quotes too, because they aren't Baptist. They probably aren't a church. It's basically one family and some hangers on who at the time were going around protesting military funerals and using vulgar language and just behaving very, very unchristian, even while they were making a lot of culture war points. And they got themselves in the news a lot because they were nasty. Well, Megan Phelps Roper is a member of that family. Uh, apparently, I think a daughter of the founder of this group. And then she says, I think in a later episode, uh, she tells more of her story. Uh, she actually ends up uh, deconstructing that, uh, not in a bad way necessarily. I, I don't think she's a Christian now, actual Christian. But she kind of goes really further in this direction of I'm going to be what we call a classical liberal. Um, I'm going to never feel certain about things again. I'm going to be mature and just try to hear all sides. And I'm going to be a good listener. But she also talks about things like, you know, graciousness and discernment. And like you see some of the Christianese coming through there. And then even Rowling is quoting some Christianese terms. But the thing that I, uh, the conclusion I came to, Marion, about this one is that neither of them seem to be so dead set about correcting for the legalism. Like they, they seem to be more interested in pursuing a reflection of human nature because they're, you know, they're very classical. They're very humanist, mm -hmm. you know, like, mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. I actually felt kind of inspired by that, but I also saw the shortcomings. Uh, Rowling, for example, said about the Harry Potter series, and she's the author, so we need to listen to her about her own goals. She said that her goal was to show uh, humanity. I think you pointed this out when we were preparing for this episode. Uh, her goal was to explore human nature. So she almost seems to me, Marion, to have a uh, rolling, to have a biblical anthropology, mm -hmm. but she needs a biblical theology proper, like Theo, God. She lacks or doesn't regard a proper biblical study of God. So she has a lot of great ideas about people that are almost biblical at times, but her world and her herself uh, doesn't seem to have any place for the idea of a divine influence. You know, I, I think it's so, so difficult to talk about this because it is. I think that she is very private about her actual feelings about God himself and about Christianity. You can hear that in her voice, right? Yeah, I yeah, I think so. I think that we probably just don't have all of the information that we would need in order to really come to that conclusion. Um, I think that she definitely identifies with being 
on the left, you know, she is actively would fight for gay rights, but not trans rights. Right. She is, you know, so she draws that kind of moral line there. Um, she's pro-choice as a as a feminist. And uh, but at the same time, you see intentional and she has said intentional religious and Christian gospel themes throughout the story um, that she intentionally hid as she was releasing each book so that people wouldn't guess the ending. And honestly, like I had someone recently say to me that they felt like the ending of Harry Potter was more Christian than Narnia. Ooh. Um, wow. And I think, yeah, this is a quite a big statement, but I think the reason is because there's probably more nuance. There's a lot of more, um, you know, spoiler alert, Harry Potter is a horcrux, you know, taking on this curse. I, I become the curse. I, you know, I die for those that I, for my friends. And enemies, by the way. The movies don't show that, but the book does. Yes, that, that's true. That's true. And I think that the nuance of just how uh, ju- the gospel themes there, honestly, like depicts something of a Christian worldview. And so, yeah, it's interesting her focus on human nature. But I think, as, I, as I've said to you before, I think that personally, I feel that anything that we find to be human nature shows a desire, a yearning that can only be satisfied in Christ. Now, whether she would reiterate that, we just can't know because she hasn't said. Right. And it would be a mistake, by the way, to say, well, she's on the left and she has an unbiblical view about same-sex attraction and uh, individual rights. I would call them synthetic rights, you know, novelty rights that people are fighting for at the political level and not so much grounded in a a, a Judeo-Christian tradition that argues for human rights. But she may have all those beliefs at the same time. That's why she's so fascinatingly complicated, because if she is a believer, for example, she is under deep cover. If for no other reason, I think you're right. She's a very private person. I think a lot of it has to do with her backstory, right? Because she shares a lot of it here. Abuse, boyfriend, husband, you know, that it's all kinds of stuff I almost don't want to spoil. But you mentioned earlier, Marion, the empathy that you feel for her. Not only is she not a witch, she is a person who has built very strong character, even in a common grace way, through suffering and has to some extent found redemption, not just by writing the most popular fantasy book series in the world, but she talks about men whom she respects and uh, the calling of motherhood and her faith, her job for readers, you know, being a maternal figure for her fandom. Like, what did you think about her, her sense of proportion about herself and some of the growth she had obviously been through over the years? Yeah, honestly, I thought her story was inspiring. It is. Um, I thought her intelligence, her wisdom, her desire to really know the truth, regardless of whether or not I agree that she has the truth in, on certain topics, that's beside the point. Like, I think that it was all so genuine. And um, I honestly, like, at the end of this podcast, all I felt was I, I just sat down and prayed for her because, oh, and I just felt great. like, what an incredible person. Like, I would just love nothing more than to just, like, get coffee with her. (laughs) That is just what I was thinking. Like, I I wouldn't even want to, this may sound terrible and anti-Great Commission, but I would just want to pick her brain a little bit. Like, uh, not to pry, not to be a gadfly, uh, but just to ask what she's been reading and, you know, where she researched her ideas before she decided to make her infamous tweets uh, a few years ago. And just connect with a fellow traveler. Uh, in our last episode, we were talking with uh, Ted Trineau about specifically how Christians ought to engage culture by planting creative oases as kind of this middle place for Christians and non-believers to meet uh, around faithful Christian creative expressions uh, that build bridges with their neighbors. Uh, and this is almost a, a kind of a, a different version of that where Christians and non-believers, at least decent non-believers, maybe we might call them noble pagans, for example, or, or just or just noble unbelievers you know, who have common grace there. They do seem to seek the truth. They reject Jesus, at least for now. But maybe they're the types of person for whom Christ, uh, whom Christ would tell, you are not far from the kingdom. I love meeting people like that. And, and I think Lewis, uh, but speaking of C.S. Lewis, you know, he had characters like that in Narnia. Yeah. You know, maybe a noble Kalorman who maybe almost sounds like Lewis is endorsing universalism, but this idea of, 
okay, maybe he's through the stable door into the afterlife, but he's still kind of wandering and he needs to figure out this whole Aslan thing. I think praying for a person like that is exactly the right response. Yeah, she just has such a heart and such a mind for seeking out what is real and what is true. And I think that's really evident in this podcast. I think that also applies to the host, uh, Megan Phelps Roper. Um, she obviously connected naturally with Rowling. In fact, Rowling in the very last episode says that the reason why they decided to do this together, I mean, uh, Phelps Roper actually went to uh, Rowling's house, which technically is classified a castle. I think its address has been doxxed a few times by activists. Uh, so I guess if you really want to, you can know where it is, but you shouldn't, you shouldn't let her be private, you know, let her take care of her kids and, and write detective books under a false name, you know, like, like any normal person would, uh, Phelps Roper interviewed her twice, uh, and they had a very open and honest conversation. And they obviously share a deep love for trying to find the truth uh, from this more traditional, uh, humanist perspective that has been somewhere deep down informed by Christianity. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. it, it's, it's so complex because you see, you know, Rowling's critics, uh, many of them are just kind of very hurting, very out of control. Uh, and they're, they're you know, into the, into the culture wars. I'm talking about her newer critics, more of the sexual activist type critics. Yeah. But then you also saw this impulse from Christians back in the day, which brings me back uh, to what you said earlier, Marion, is that you thought that actually the podcast episode two erred on the side of almost being too gentle to the uh, concerned fundamentalist critics at the time who were literally trying to get it, you know, off the library bookshelves and schools and things and, you know, going <laughs> way too far with the email forwards. Yeah, kind of familiar stuff, right? Um, and Rowling was sympathetic. Uh, Phelps Roper was sympathetic. Interestingly, you know, given their both of their negative experiences with more culturally conservative Christians, I find that interesting and also inspiring. But I think you mentioned it. I think it's right. And I want to elaborate on this, that it seems safe now to view those people as just misunderstood uh, when the loudest and most angry people are, are the ones, you know, cussing an R-rated streak on the street. And right. then they add the little reverb effect in the podcast. You know, the Christians were nasty often in their legalistic fervor, uh, zeal without knowledge, we might call it, but they weren't cussing on the street. So I guess it feels safe, but you and I may have had a different experience with some of that stuff. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, obviously, the reason I'm even writing the book that I'm writing right now is because I think that this is still very, very prominent. Um, fantasy is still growing. Witchcraft is growing at an exponential rate. The amount of people in the new age now is just unfathomable. I mean, you just walk into Barnes and Noble and in the little atrium, you find books on witchcraft and the new age. You walk into any little kitschy store, like down by the beach, anywhere, whatever, and you will find books on witchcraft. It is, it is the new thing. It is a huge, massive trend. And um, so I think it is very, very important for us to continue having this conversation about the occult. And one of the things that I felt like was um, very interesting um, and and really shows the disconnect between Rowling and her critics at that time. The legalist is that she doesn't believe in magic. She does not. But the critics often did. And the Rowling was teaching did. it. Yes. And, and, and here's the that's why this is such an important conversation to have. Why we need to know is because people Rowling and her critics don't understand magic. They don't know what it is. They don't know if it's real. They don't know how it's real or what the Bible really means when it prohibits it and how someone can and cannot get involved with magic. They don't understand the theology of magic, which is, you know, why I'm talking about this. But I also think that is why they were so angry, because they didn't know how to categorize this book properly. Right. This is I, this is absolutely 100% a witch hunt because people are saying, I don't understand magic. I know that this is scary. I'm afraid. And people are afraid of things they don't understand. And I think that that gets into that a little bit. I don't want to I don't want to jump ahead too much, but it does get into that a little bit with the Salem witch trials is that people want to um, think that, well, witchcraft is an abomination to the Lord and the Bible calls it an abomination because it is one of the worst forms of idolatry. And so therefore, if I find evidence that somebody is guilty of this thing, then I have the right to kill them. 
because that is, you know, Leviticus 20. Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. Like even, uh, even non-Christians know the phrase anyway, the paraphrase. Yeah. Yeah. So, so there's, there's, they feel as if they have the right, just like people, just like the Puritans did to hang witches. They have the right to, to enact justice on somebody who they find guilty of, of this abomination. And um, I think that's just a complete misunderstanding of, of the biblical view of this topic. Marion, I invite pushback here uh, with a statement I'm about to give. If in the late 90s, early 2000s, whenever it was true that Rowling's books were pushing actual witchcraft, would it have made more sense for Christian parents and others to have concerns and even try to persuade public schools to take them off the shelves? I think that if they were truly promoting real witchcraft and the, the genuine occult, I, as a parent, would have concerns. Now, would I go to the school and ask them to take the book down? Probably not. Right. Um, because the, it, is a, it is a discernment in which I, we exercise within our own home. And it's something that I, I would talk to my children about, but it's not something that I would probably go to the school and ask to be removed, no. Right. That there, I think, is a question of wisdom. Is that something that you as a Christian parent feel called to? And lots of Christian and other culturally conservative parents whose kids are in public school, they do now feel called uh, to go to the public school and ask for books with legitimate, harmful, you know, sexually toxic content to be removed. Uh, I think they have a point, or maybe I think you that's should a completely different get topic. Your kids out. It, it is, but this podcast ties them together by saying that there are some uh, cases. Uh, you know, it's not a political podcast, but there are some uh, cases now that were decided back then uh, that relate to the similar struggles when parents are going to the school board saying, "Hey, we need to take the book off the shelves," and then other people see that and they think, "Well." Yeah, but back then you were doing that with Harry Potter and that turned out to be no big deal. Are we not doing the boy who cried wolf thing? Maybe just a little bit. So you can see maybe how some people are getting confused about that. And mm -hmm. either way, I think it's just more incentive for Christians to discern. If you're going to be concerned about witchcraft and occult practices and things, which you ought to be because God forbids them, they are harmful to you. They are uh, real you, too. You're real. Yes, we are not materialists like rolling, apparently, at least in terms of magic. Like we do believe that there are dark spiritual forces out there, whether they're masquerading as aliens or witches or angels of light. You know, they are out there, and Christians disagree on the level of power they have, but Christians must agree that they do exist. We can't just reject them and only talk about what we think about or, or what we do. Uh, there are harmful spiritual influences. And I think parents are right to be concerned uh, that their kids may fall into that stuff. But there is something to be said as well about motive. It seems not to be something you can just stumble into. You know, innocent child picks up a book and then reads a Latin phrase and then suddenly uh, they want to practice divination like Professor Trelawney. <laughs> but I can understand then, like, because back then, Mary, we didn't have book seven. We didn't have that ending, you know, where uh, Harry is basically reenacting a sort of version of penal substitutionary atonement. <laughs> Uh, even more than Narnia, by the way, that's more, you know, uh, Christus Victor in uh, The Lion, the Western Wardrobe. And then they get the sacrifice done and, and right. move on to some other themes. Harry Potter builds toward it. I think there yeah. is an argument to be made that it is a stronger emphasis on that theme. But we didn't have that ending then. All we had was, you know, dark, whimsical, you know, people sneaking around a dark forest, drinking unicorn blood. You know, it did seem kind of scary at the time. Yeah, so I'm it a little did. Sympathetic. It did. How, I'm sympathetic because I think that people don't understand magic. That's why I'm sympathetic. Mm, yeah. And I think that people don't pe gen like people who are just saying, well, what should I think about this? The, you know, I don't know. Like, that's a genuine concern. And I'm hugely sympathetic to that. Um, however, the thing that ties these two topics together in this podcast is not that we should approach them in the same way. Right. The thing that ties them together is that they have both become as Rowling herself said, a fundamentalist position. And she had like said it very, very well that she is very concerned about the left becoming more and more authoritarian and fundamentalist in its nature and its activism, and that they are beginning to mimic the attitude and of, of the fundamentalist right to go out on witch, witch hunts and et cetera, and uh, my way or the highway. And I think that absolutely that is that is the uh, the through line here is the legalism. 
And so I, I, I don't think that these two that these two things should be approached in the same way. I don't think that if if there was a if there was a book about witchcraft in my child's school, I would not approach it in the same way as if there was something about gender in my child's school. Gotcha. Because even though the new age is prominent right now, I think that the way that people are becoming introduced to it is far more often in their own homes. Right. Or through a friend. Witch talk, Instagram, which is Instagram, or social media. Yes. yes, or online. And picking up a book, maybe that's fiction. I have not personally heard a story in which someone was introduced to the occult that way. That doesn't mean it hasn't happened. It just means that I think it's probably lesser of a concern. And also um, the the desire that that heart instinct to want to to be involved with witchcraft is going to happen less often than someone who is struggling with sexual issues. Yes, I agree. Because we are, because that's just the human nature. We struggle with sexual issues far more often than witchcraft. So right now uh, people may still fear that witchcraft is growing, you know, just like they feared it was growing in the late nineties and early two thousands. Well, there is. was some evidence that it was, I mean, they actually point this out. In the podcast, you know, NBR did a feature about, you know, the, the Wiccans doing their chants and syncretizing all different types of religions uh, and subsuming that into uh, Wiccan ideas. Uh, but now I would say, and I've said it before, the fastest growing religion, uh, certainly in Western cultures, uh, post-Christian cultures, uh, would be, I think, what I call the religion of sexualityism. We'll talk about more about, about that in chapter three. And what's kind of fun is that Rowling, you know, she may actually be not on our side with the magic, but for a different reason, because she thinks more materialist about that. Whereas we as Christians believe that there is a threat there, just not necessarily in Rowling's books, unless you go there looking for them to endorse the idolatry you already have in your heart, uh, wanting to go off and control your world through means of uh, occult practices. Uh, it's the sexuality is though, I think that is the uh, the most corrosive hazard that we're facing now. And unfortunately, Marion, we've seen even some Christian fans have been getting into that stuff out of an understandable desire, I think, often to be empathetic. But we can go into that more in chapter three. I know, faithful listener, that you have a lot to say about this topic already, and we still have two chapters to go. So where you're going to want to go to talk about this is the Lorehaven Guild. That is our exclusive Discord server, and I saw an empty slot here, uh, the podcast, so I took it uh, to have ourselves as a sponsor. And you can get into that server and join our quest parties. Uh, the next one coming up is for a book called The Beast of Talisend. That's coming up in September. Elijah David is leading that one. We do monthly book quests through the best Christian-made fantastical novels we can find. And we also talk about important topics like this one in all our different rooms in the Guild Castle. To join, you just go to lorehaven.com slash subscribe, uh, enter your email address. It's not given out or sold. We just give you, free for the asking, your uh, exclusive invitation uh, to portal into the guild or apparate or whatever uh, means of travel you prefer the most. By the way, uh, heads up, we are going to go ahead and announce that October book quest as well, earlier than we usually do, uh, just because the book is a little harder to get hold of. So brace yourselves. It's going to be kind of a dark paranormal book, uh, one of my favorites, and I'm looking forward to leading a book quest through that during spooky season this year. It's coming up fast. So speaking of spooky season, Marion, uh, I'm sure we'll still be talking some about legalism, uh, either the Christian kind that we might call fundamentalism, the bad kind of that, as well as the newer kind. But what's also interesting in that podcast is what I've called uh, chapter two, the fact that Rowling's best-selling books built the next generation of fandom. And we really get into that with episode three of the witch trials of JK Rowling. Uh, Harry Potter probably would not have gotten as big as it did. If not for the fledgling internet, I was that day years old when I heard in that episode that MuggleNet was founded in 1999 by a, 12 year old homeschool kid from Indiana. So wow. apparently not all homeschoolers were forbidden from reading Harry Potter books. So uh, <laughs> maybe homeschool fans of the show, uh, your experience is, is not normative, or maybe the homeschool kid was just in one of those uh, extremely cool homeschool families, even in the late nineties. I also found it fascinating, Marion, the, uh, the stuff that they talked about in this episode about the fandom. Uh, and we could have a whole fantastical truth show about this uh, if we wanted to. Uh, the emphasis that they gave to the fact that uh, in the early days of the fandom, the bullies and trolls had disproportionate power in those fan communities. 
Right. And I was only in Christian fan communities at the time. I, I wasn't in the Harry Potter community that early, but we see plenty of trolls and bullies now. Uh, I would say that actually we see a biblical term for one type of troll we see now, and that is the term fool, <laughs> uh, which is condemned in Proverbs. You know, the, the fool is going to fall into a pit of his own making. He's going to fall in with the wrong crowd. Like everything bad happens to the fool one way or another in the book of Proverbs. And so it is with the trolls that we see in these, uh, these internet communities. Interestingly, though, I wonder if you would have noticed this, Marion. Uh, there was a lot of stuff they set up here about the fact that these fandoms online had a lot of good things and they connected people and like whole families got started. But you also had a disproportionate influence by the loudmouths and the trolls and the bullies and the people who let their imaginations run away with them and started making up identities. And then later on, the podcast just kind of forgets that largely that's where a lot of this stuff came from. But Rowling kind of points out that she was observing in 2012 a shift in the fandom. It always had some issues, but she said specifically around 2012, because she haunted these forums herself, as she noticed a shift toward the negative. And mm -hmm. yet after that, the podcast just kind of takes all these new identities and the spectrum of genders and these made up mm -hmm. terms and the phobias, like just acts like it just stepped out of thin air when really the previous episode showed that people made it up on Tumblr and other websites like that. Yeah, yeah. I think um, it it just became the internet just festered. You know, it just it just became this hotbed of create your own identity because you have you have anonymity, but you have a bunch of people who are just as weird as you, and you realize, oh, I'm not alone because I thought I was alone. I thought I was isolated um, in my own little community, and now that I realize that that's not true. I am just, and I have anonymity. I can say anything I want. I can be anyone that I want. Mm. And the bullying is absolutely fostered. And like the fact that you can go out and say to someone without consequence, with that is, that is a huge part, part of it is I can say anything I want to anyone without consequence. And I can, I can feel so justified, so vindicated in my worldview um, and so, and so, just to be able to to bully, to put down, to have that kind of pride of I just bested you um, with my words and with my with my own self identity. That just festered. I think what we now have is the uh, fundamentalist left and and council culture, and that is the age old problem of the internet. Uh, that this is something that was meant to do good and it does do good. And yet it is also a source of some of our, the greatest evils that we will ever face as a society. People making stuff up on the internet, especially with anonymity consequence free, except for the consequences in their own lives. I would say they have no moral authority. And that's actually a phrase that I use at least to remind myself. And occasionally I've actually turned it on a troll uh, who is assuming they have this moral authority and some mm -hmm. powerful force of novelty at their back. And all it takes, uh, at least for your own survival, is just to say to that person, like, you have no moral authority to make that claim. Just to not give them the ground, uh, the, not give them the assumed power that they assume to themselves. Yeah, it's really, really interesting that you bring up the the topic of authority because that's something that, that Rowling talked about herself throughout the podcast is that she has always been anti-authoritarianism. Now, what she means by authoritarianism is people who take their authority and use it to coerce and manipulate and abuse those who are beneath them, and which is thus the bullying. Um, I don't think that she really meant that no one should ever have any level of actual authority. I'm assuming, although she didn't pointedly say that, but I think that it is people who believe that they have authority in themselves. They are the authority. They need no other authority because I think this this speaks to the heart of human nature. It speaks to the heart of, honestly, actually the occult, um, as I've been learning late recently, is I am my own God. I am something in me is divine. I can create my own reality. And, and to some people, the occult is the way that they do that through the supernatural. However, people who are, who are in this sexualityism, as you say, um, are creating their own reality. They are their own God. They can decide who they are. And the authority, they don't need a loving God who knows what's best for them as a parent does because they reject that as authoritarianism. When in reality, 
God does not coerce. He does not abuse. He does not manipulate. Any authority he has is to say, if you do it my way, you're, it's going to be better for you. You're going to be actually happier. You're actually going to be blessed if you do things my way. I know that this thing that you think is going to make you happy is going to hurt you in the end. And that's not authoritarianism. So yeah, it's just that rejection of that loving parent, um, a rejection of him as being a wrongful authority figure. That was a huge theme for me throughout this podcast. Another big theme is just the legacy of broken families or broken relationships leading, I think, to people like often on, on this movement and the left rejecting legitimate authority, like you said, Mary, and not just authoritarianism, rolling can sort between them, even having had very clearly some very traumatic relationships, like her mother died early, you know, she suffered domestic abuse and assault and all kinds of things, you know, having to steal away in the dead of night. And we almost didn't get uh, the first Harry Potter book. And to know what that's about, you have to listen to the show. Even after all that, Rowling has the capacity, and we're going to sound like stands here, by the way, let's just admit it. Um, <laughs> we definitely just have our disagreements, but she does have the capacity to show uh, critical appreciation, which is a phrase Ted Turneau used uh, previously, for her own fandom. Um, she is not above engaging with that and saying, okay, what are, like, she could read the pop culture parent and, and say, okay, so I see the good, the true, and the beautiful in the fandom for the books that I wrote. But I also see the idolatry. She'd probably use another word. I see the authoritarianism. I see the people who are not reading the books right. And they actually think that they know the books better than me, which is just ridiculous. ridiculous. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> so, ridiculous. so ridiculous. Yes. And, and the, which is even more ridiculous is that logically that person wants to be heard for their intent uh, rather than to be interpreted the way they're insisting on interpreting everybody else. So it's just absolute death of the author. Um, it's literally on the same spectrum as the sin that sent Satan from the presence of God, you know, rejecting yes. the creator. It is, uh, it is the height of arrogance there. Mm -hmm. um, it's amazing common grace that we see in Rowling's life, uh, particularly because like some of her characters versus uh, the Daily Prophet and the mainstream media in uh, the Harry Potter wizarding world, she seems to have a built-in natural resistance to media trends. Uh, even though like she is a superstar and so she doesn't buy into a lot of mainstream media stuff. And, and she doubts a lot of institutions like, you know, higher education and the, and the healthcare industry and things like that. She also uh, didn't buy into the whole rhetoric in the nineties that the internet is here. We're going to have a collective consciousness. Uh, this is the age of digital Aquarius and we're all going to learn to understand each other from across the world. You know, it's going to be the Epcot center dream. We're all riding on this spaceship earth. Well, now we're dealing with reality. And they even say that in the podcast. Uh, the internet now, social media especially, has uh, exacerbated the deep disagreements that we have, the traumas that we have, the different religious worldviews that we have. Someone on the podcast says, social media has corrupted the dream. Well, we know it actually corrupted the dream. It was the, 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 the sin. There it is again the greatest ignored villain in this podcast. Uh, and yet I think the Harry Potter series presents sin very well. Voldemort says there is no good or evil, Harry. There's only power and yeah. those too weak to seek it. An incredible rebuke of moral relativism out of the gate. Book one yeah. for kids, you guys. Mm -hmm. um, that is astounding. And then there's yeah. more stuff here about big tech and the profit motives and, you know, valuing the profit over humanity, turning it into an idol. Marion, I was kind of especially engaged with this idea I kind of alluded to earlier that you had this war on the internet that is kind of now been evolved into the real world and it's ghastly. Basically, it was 4chan versus Tumblr, according to the author of a book called Kill All Normies. And this idea that a lot of the stuff like uh, cultural appropriation and that's problematic, like it did start as Tumblr memes and now it's just kind of common parlance. Like, how did you feel about going back to kind of the elemental origins of these culture wars? Yeah, again, I, oh gosh, I feel like a broken record because I feel like anytime I ever write anything or get on this podcast or really talk at all about anything ever, I'm going to talk about extremism and overcorrection. Yes. yes. And this is, I'm sorry, I just, this is just my soapbox because um, I see this everywhere. And I've said this recently, like, 
a great illustration of this is um, what they call Newton's pendulum, which is those four little balls, you know, on the strings. And you just, you pull one up on the one side and the other one just like shoots off in the other direction. And it's just this constant back and forth of them just like shooting each other in opposite directions. That's, that is our world. That is, it is absolutely a part of human nature. And, and Rowling even gets into that in one of the I think second to last or last episodes in which she talks about men going off into extremes because of how badly they are treated. And I think that Tumblr and 4, 4chan or 4chan, I don't yes. even know. Yes, well, how 4chan, it. there was an 8chan. 4chan is like where 4chan. the basically is associated with the alt right, like the actual right, yeah. alt right, not just someone who is regular right. It's actual alt right. Right. Uh, in cells, you know, angry young men, uh, trolls. Right nincompoops malcontents you know guys sharing mm -hmm. cartoon frogs ironically whatever yeah and that, all, that's kind of all always all, in both of these of course there's always porn um right, and right. so um in their own ways in their own um categories and i think yeah but go, yeah to go back to overcorrection like that it is just the epitome of that there is there is no place more primed to to display the dangers of extremism and overcorrection and being in stuck in reactionary thought patterns than the internet. <laughs> and that is just the epitome of that. And I think that Rowling is absolutely correct to say that if the left, if the fundamentalist left continues to treat men and women in these ways, they then they have no they have no choice but to go to extreme places um, and extreme worldviews in order to re get relief and from from the abuse that they have been and the and the verbal abuse that they've they've been suffering from these other extreme positions exactly and that's no reason to get like you know the the activist uh you know the misogynist who is going on a rampage and treating people horribly like that doesn't get him off the hook but you know you may have to put a stop to him you know maybe even lock him up for a time lest he hurt himself and others but it also helps to know how did he get there so we can prevent this from happening again, you know, whether you're going from one extreme to the other. And I did not expect J.K. Rowling, of all people, to be uh, at her own institution of Hogwarts, uh, the professor in residence of Muggle Social Studies. But that is her rank. Uh, and she comes across that way here. And then it's like she has a, a visiting uh, professor, faculty member uh, from the whole crew of the podcast. They even talk about how the Tumblr idea is like spread to Twitter and Twitter being disproportionately populated by uh, elite journalists. And that's how these ideas got seeded out uh, into the larger culture. So, folks, if you're seeing this stuff and you just wonder, you know, especially if the writers who want to know where stuff came from, where words came from, like get interested in the etymology uh, and trace it back to its source if you can. And just question things like Rowling, I think, rightly does question where these terms came from. Question whether these morals or these rights are real, organic, natural for humanity, or rather whether they are synthetic and were brewed up in a digital uh, wild lab somewhere, whether it's uh, 4chan or Tumblr or any other forum. And just watch out for some of these ideas uh, that have disproportionate influence on people, uh, in addition to just simply not being a godly influence. From there, we're going to go to our third sponsor for this episode. Before we jump into our third chapter, this is returning author Michelle M. Brune with her young adult epic fantasy Song Flight and its sequel Storm Dance. For centuries, humanity has fought dragons in a war to eradicate their evil from the land. Elisa, daughter of a slayer chief, was already kept from the line of succession by her vocal stutter. And matters only worsen when her empathic powers are revealed to connect uncontrollably to the dragon enemy. But when her growing powers reveal a dragon's belief in the maker, Elisa wonders if the tales of their fallen souls are even true. Now she must make the most important decision of her life, remain with her clan in comfortable silence, or find her voice to end the unjust war between the races. The young adult epic fantasy Song Flight and its sequel Storm Dance look at themes of friendship, justice, and mercy and following it, God's calling, no matter the difficulties. You can learn more, as with all our sponsors, in our show notes for episode 177, or go to lorehaven.com slash podcast sponsors to get everything at once. Uh, this sponsor, you can go directly to Michelle M. Brune, Michelle with two L's, B-R-U-H-N dot com slash song flight. I always love it when a sponsor drops right in with some uh, parallel themes there. 
empathy there, fighting dragons, trying to discern whether the dragons are actually evil or may have a a secret belief in their own maker. Uh, And even the uh, hesitancy of of speech, Marion, I I mentioned earlier how Rowling herself speaks very carefully uh, and and very mildly, and yet she clearly has very strong beliefs, uh, which is a wonderful paradox. And it almost makes me admire her more because she's not like some you know, cultural conservative firebrand with a podcast. She's Mm -hmm. a woman who's been through a lot of suffering and yet still holds these very strong beliefs, uh, which led her to the subject of chapter three here about how Rowling's new critiques angered the modern sexual activists. They got so mad that one of them says they quoted a few times on the podcast, uh, in a, in a fight, well, maybe this wasn't just about rolling, but it was one of those clashes where the Tumblr 4chan wars, you know, broke out into reality and people are screaming at each other in the streets. And you see this one guy saying, you know, bleep it and bleep it and bleep you, you ugly bleep, 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 you will die alone and you will burn in hell. That wasn't a fundamentalist Christian zealot. Uh, it was no. very clearly a, a culture warrior type kind of the next generation of internet troll. He's now no longer behind the mask of his browser. He's out in public, uh, presumably unmasked. And, and so are a whole lot of people on a whole lot of different sides, wielding disproportionate power through their anger and or their victim complex and or their sense of unearned moral superiority and through a simple abuse of imagination about these identities. And this is where, Marion, the podcast here frustrated me, as I mentioned, because they spent so much time earlier exploring where these identities came from and people sitting around with anonymity and space to explore their you know, alternative imaginations. And then the podcast just kind of forgot that that's where it came from and just assumed that this stuff stepped out of the cultural primordial ooze the podcast itself said that all these identities you know i'm i'm this kind of sexual expression or i identify with this or i'm non this or i'm to that you know all all the different terms that we see uh, people identifying themselves instead of simple man or woman a lot of that stuff got started with tumblr scientists didn't discover it People were making those up and then the social scientists kind of caught on. Oh, well, this is how people are identifying. So I guess we need to go along with that. The podcast didn't really tie it back when they were suddenly talking about all these different groups claiming rights. And then they just sort of said, well, I I guess now, for example, we we just need to uh, treat the trans cause as if it's if it's legitimate. And yet, shouldn't that maybe bring a little bit more challenge? Like, wait a minute. A lot of these ideas got started on tumblr on on the internet it doesn't mean automatically they're wrong but it does mean that it's not scientific it doesn't have a religious tradition it doesn't have a a grand philosophical foundation Um, yeah that's what i mean and i think that but that's the thing is like the 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 whole point of this podcast was to give voice to people who had opposing positions right they are trying to to be objective Yes. And to listen and to just kind of give. um, And I think that is where the host really her heart is at. Her heart is I was not a listener. I had no empathy for people who disagreed with me. All I did was yell in their faces. And so for her to just kind of swing to the other extreme is makes perfect sense to me and so she is just saying she she absolutely is making no moral judgments and is just listening and i think that that was absolutely made logical sense for the podcast to go there in my opinion because of her because of where she was leading it um and it was honestly even though she seemed to be trying to portray a position of like, I'm a moderate, I just want to listen to everybody and hear everybody's heart at the same time, she swung to the point of, I can be certain about nothing. There's nothing in my life that is certain. There is nothing I can really know for a fact. And as much as Rowling almost seemed to agree with her at times because of her desire to listen and to be empathetic and to read other people's books at the same time, she was just saying, but, but, but no, I've really thought about this. And I think I really genuinely think they're wrong. And so she 
is certain and as much as she can be about something. And I think that that was something that Megan Phelps Roper was definitely lacking. And I think that it is actually as much as it's masquerading as a moderate position, it's an extreme position of I can be certain about nothing. And, and there's a fear there. There's a fear of what if I'm wrong again? Because she was wrong. She was a fundamentalist. She was in a fundamentalist cult and she hurt people. I think there's a deep seated fear there of like, of what if I hurt someone again? What if my words hurt someone again? And, um, and that's, yeah. So to take that extremist position makes perfect sense to me. It does. And, and that's a good point is that it, one could say for the host that it, it, it is an arguable overcorrection from absolute certainty about lies and legalism and really hatred all disguised in evangelistic terms, uh, which, uh, which it's all messed up. It's, it's an absolute mess there with that, with that cult that she got out of. I would much prefer her be uncertain about her moral perspectives uh, rather than be a legalistic cult that gives Christ a bad name. Sure. But I also <laughs> would say, you know, and it just as I would say to any listeners, like if you're feeling that way, like uncertainty, like doubt is always good. Uncertainty is good. You don't want to be certain about the wrong things. Way to go, but keep going. Christ does promise some measure of certainty in yeah. biblical worldview foundations. You must find the foundation. Get rid of the stuff that you should not have been certain about and get back to the stuff that you should be certain about. And I think you're right, Mary, that Rowling yeah. is certain about things. And specifically, she's certain about the things that she started tweeting about. She still believes in human autonomy. She believes in same-sex attraction and you know this redefinition of marriage and all the, all the culture stuff. But she does not believe that a woman can turn into a man and vice versa and then ought to go into the spaces of the opposite sex. Right. If for no other reason, then there are people in there who are legitimately fearful Vul and victims, vulnerable. Yeah, vulnerable. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Objectively vulnerable. Yeah. I think that her certainty about that, because she is so, she is right. These people are vulnerable. She's right. We have to protect them. And um, her knowing that, being certain about that, um, really speaks to her character in this. In this, um, and but at the same time, there is that desire in both of them to be empathetic and to see the individual. And I think that that is what we are missing in cancel culture and in fundamentalism. Honestly, both we are we are lacking the ability to see the individual as Christ sees them for the far right even in this in this cancel in this culture war you know we've discussed this privately but um you know that my position is always one of of compassion compassion to the individual because when when i research these topics i i am far less inclined to look at you know how is this affecting our schools how is this affecting our bathrooms i'm much more inclined to um look at first of all the theological position of it always um, and to really be grounded in truth, um, because that what the Bible says, really, I am certain that it is right, whether or not we're interpreting it right is is um, is what is can be not certain. I always then after that, I go to personal testimony um, because this is something that I have not experienced. So I want to have empathy for this person because I think that's what Christ would do. And I think that going to that personal testimony and hearing someone's heart. And hearing, um, so I, I have heard multiple testimonies, many testimonies, you can just look them up on YouTube, of people who have, who were trans, who, who transitioned and then were saved. And I am a believer in um, long-suffering evangelism and discipleship of people who are genuinely hurting. Amen. And people who are genuinely in pain. And... And I think that one of the greatest um, like harms that is being done by cancel culture and by the fundamentalist left and even by the fundamentalist right or the far right is that when we only focus on the, the culture war and when we only focus on legislation, we forget the individual, even Christians, we forget to say, did you know, and, and we're just out there fighting for our rights. When in reality, we need to say to these people, did you know that there are resources out there that can help you with this that are not that that, that don't require painful surgeries and injections that will not permanently change your body? 
and that you can find and that 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 it's that that heart of Christ with the woman at the well. She was a serial adulteress. And he said to her, like, you're you're searching, you're looking for something, you're looking for it in men and in sex, and you will never find it. You will always be thirsty. You will always have to keep coming back to this well. You will always have to keep going back to this men, and you will always be thirsty again. And, and you think that you're satisfied for a little while, and then you're thirsty again, but I will give you living water, and you will never thirst again. And that is the message that we should have for these people, people who are in the occult, People are who are who think that transitioning is going to is going to make them happy. So you you may be happy for a little while. You may be, but you will be thirsty again, and only Jesus will satisfy you. And I think to to say to con, to consistently be focusing on the culture war and legislation and what is in our movies and what is in our schools is going to event like is going to harm the witness of being able to say Jesus is enough for you. Jesus is the answer. Look, look, here are the resources that we love you. And I think that, and I saw that I, even though I think that what is ending up on Twitter from rolling tends to be more, more culture war. In oh, tone. she's definitely more combative. I think she's adapting her voice and her snark to the she's, medium. Yes. And I, I, no, I, no I would, reason. I would say that that is one thing that I disagree with is that culture war tone online where personally I would find it, but when when she speaks on this podcast she she seems to really say I really do see and understand the pain that these people are going through and and I think that 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 is the key to being heard poss- potentially some people will never hear some people will never want to listen but for some of those people to be pulled out of what the, of the cult that they are in is to say I see you I hear you there are other answers. There are different answers out there for you. Amen to all of that. Uh, you cannot go after the public policy and the movies and all that stuff, uh, do the culture war stuff and call it a day. The Christian's job is bigger than that. And often the Christian's job will be, uh, believe it or not, not to do those things. Sometimes you, you, we are not called to be always on any more than during an actual physical war. A soldier is called to be always on. There are tactical retreats. There are armistices with the enemy. There are uh, territories traded and prisoners swapped. And even if you are to grant the culture war metaphor, and I'm actually hoping to go over this a little bit more in our next episode, if we plan it right, then you need to follow the rules of a just war. There's some Christian ideas there that Christians can debate, and that would get us uh, a little bit too far afield. But we are called to reach out to the persons. and. It's a wisdom call too. You may need, as Rowling has done on Twitter, uh, when she's not talking with people one-on-one and doesn't have a relationship there, it may be, I think, time to pick up a, a megaphone and blare it out over uh, you know, the crowd of tens of thousands uh, and issue a clarion call, uh, no uncertain signal about what she believes and who she's going to defend and who she thinks is harmful. But it would be absolutely foolish and I think even sinful for a Christian to decide, well, if Rowling can give a, a microphone or megaphone shout across that many people, then I think I'm going to do that right here in this little room in my public library. I think I'm going to do that to the person across the coffee table yeah. uh, next to me. No, absolutely not. Uh, that that is that is now you're not a culture, you're not a peaceful culture warrior, you're not a culture right. warrior poet or a culture just warrior. You're just a mercenary mm-hmm. at that point. And Rowling does not come across as a mercenary. Not none of these folks do. Even some of the uh, the sexual activists they talk to, uh, they obviously have taken uh, obviously taken great pains to find people who are well spoken and uh, to some extent have some maturity or at least the appearance of maturity. Marion, I think that's what does divide and maybe add some distance between uh, Rowling and and Phelps Roper and and some of their allies there, some of the more classic humanists or even the more classic feminist sorts. Uh, they've obviously been through a lot of suffering and a lot of things that they've grown uh, out of. And I think that they seem to have found or are still feeling or are, are, are still finding some healing from that. And I think that people on, uh, on the sexual activism side, they maybe see that and they cannot understand that. They maybe assume that if that person is quiet, soft-spoken, you know, speaks softly and carries a big stick, uh, but does seem to care, like, 
that is alien and unnatural to the person who is still in great pain, whether it's from others' abuse or self-inflicted. And so there's a divide now, which is also kind of frustrating because then, you know, Rowling is saying, well, like, you know, here I stand, I can do no other, you know, I'm, I'm not going to budge from this. And Philip Roper is expressing some admiration for that. And they're talking about warnings about, you know, don't listen to your own adrenaline when you're feeling uh, high off your own, you know, moral supremacist fumes, like challenge yourself, be careful. But these people, the activists, like they don't feel that they have that luxury. I think that they are just living in crisis from a difference between what they feel inside and what they're uh, hearing from the world. And, and they're talking all the time about how much joy, joy, joy they feel, but it's very clear, like they don't feel that. And I think that's where the Christian does need to show up and very compassionately, maybe a little subversively say, Hey, like, I know deep down, like this isn't working. Like maybe you're feeling it's working now, but eventually right. it will not work. And Marion, I think it's already starting right. to not work. Like some of, some of the train is losing steam in the UK and the health departments. And like some of the scientists are starting to ask questions and even some of the journalists are asking questions. So right or wrong culture warrior or not like folks like rolling with the megaphones blaring out, uh, even a little aggressively are having some results and then maybe that in effect can be like a kind of law that then drives more people lost in this mess uh to the grace that can't be found in mutual understanding but can only be found ultimately mm -hmm. in the yeah. gospel yeah i do i do hope that that these kinds of things and that her position on this does actually reach someone um i i have no idea how how that would happen or um but but for someone who's wise and compassionate and intelligent and um, to be able to say, hey, like, this isn't OK. Um, I do hope that 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 reaches people, whether or not she's actually giving them something that will last is debatable at this point. But, yeah, I do hope for that. And I and I and I hope for with my own work to just speak into the legalism that still exists within the church. Um, and to create more empathy, to create more understanding and more um, compassion for people and um, who are trapped in things like the occult and, um, and honestly, any type of stronghold of the world in which we can, we can obviously say this is demonic. Absolutely. And I think we cannot discount that. Uh, we can't just blame the social medias or the political influence or the policies or the bad health care. Like, there is some real spiritual oppression here. And for a yes. Christian, especially a Christian who has undergone some spiritual oppression and who understands the darkness from which we have been brought into the light by Jesus, like we should be led to that sympathy for people who are still trapped in it. You know, yes. if they're actively punching you in the head, you know, attacking the image of God in you, then yeah, you may need to call a cop <laughs> to lock them up temporarily, but that doesn't fix the problem. The law must eventually lead to grace, you know, put down the gun. Don't always fight the culture war. Uh, not always. You must also be aware of your role as as an evangelist. Like that is the Christian's job, uh, as Ted was saying in our last episode, you know, to to find those touch points. And Harry Potter is a tremendous touch point. A lot of people still lost in these ideas like uh, they feel that they can trust her or that they trusted her before she betrayed them. And. You know, hopefully then like having her speak compassionately one on one to those people when she can and then speaking uh, from her platform, not always with the megaphone, you know, maybe reminding them of some of the themes in her books. They're not just about acceptance, you know, without any limits at all. They're about also human nature and good and evil and standing up for what you believe in and fighting against the trends and doing what's right uh, for its own sake. Like those themes are in Harry Potter, too. Yes. And so rolling, I think, has demonstrated then how to build one of those oases of imagination, even as maybe a non-Christian where people, you know, maybe they're not feeling thirsty. Maybe they're going off, you know, throwing sand into their faces instead of going for the water, the refreshing water that she's giving them. Right. But hopefully they'll go back there and then hopefully they'll find an even better, deeper oasis of imagination to connect with Christians who have a better answer than these power plays or these, these victim, um, uh, these victim defenses. Like, Rolling, I think, ultimately, and we'll, we'll draw to a close here, like, I think, you know, up, unless she starts bringing in something deeper than uh, a belief in, in a strong belief in human nature, ultimately, it's going to come down to a power play. Who yeah. has the better victim story? Is it going to be the people who feel that their bodies don't match their souls and they need to change themselves and have everybody else recognize them by new pronouns? 
are they the biggest victims or are people like Rowling and her tragedy of being abused and, and the women in shelters and you know places who have been beaten and abused, like, do they have the biggest uh, uh, victim need? I could choose there, but ultimately we're dealing with a lot of different victims here and it's going to be complex. And I'm glad I don't have to solve all that on this podcast. <laughs> we're just That's talking right. about it from the imagination <laughs> perspective, but great stories and discussions like this. I can hopefully help contribute to those conversations. So we need to pray for Rolling, pray for the folks doing this podcast, uh, pray for those Christians who are in government who have to reconcile all these thorny issues and uh, listen to some really loud voices and discern uh, who needs what. Uh, this is something that's going to be more and more important to Christians uh, going forward. Uh, Marion, there's a lot more to say here, I know, but I have no doubt there's going to be a sequel about this one. But in the meantime, uh, where can folks keep track of your work, uh, particularly with respect to? Uh, that book, Discerning Fictional Magic from a Christian Worldview. You can follow me. Um, I'm most active on Instagram. It's uh, at um, M.A. Jacobs Writes and my website, majacobs.com. Um, I'm also on Facebook, but not as active on there. So, All right, then. And definitely look for Marion as well uh, at Lorehaven. We've got a lot of her articles, including quite a few about fictional magic. So a little bit of a sneaky spoiler for her book, maybe, but I have no doubt that the book's going to go to some places that she hasn't uh, gone in her article. So, Marion, thank you so much for joining us. This week, uh, we're having a new review at Lorehaven. We're previewing Sarah Ella's new fantasy novel, The Looking Glass Illusion. That's the sequel to The Wonderland Trials. We got an early look at that book, and you'll get to get that early look, too, when that releases uh, Friday after release date. Uh, by the way, I almost forgot this, but uh, we had a wandering Facebook group out there for Lorehaven uh, that uh, had a bit of an uncertain purpose after we started the Lorehaven Guild. So we rebranded it a little. Uh, it's now a Facebook group focused on the Lorehaven Library, that section of our site where we don't review every book, but we do accept uh, submissions of the title and cover and information from Christian authors if the book is published and fantastical and genre. So then we post that on the library group on Facebook, and you can follow us there uh, to keep up with everything that arrives on our digital shelves. You can subscribe free as well, as I mentioned, for the Guild, to get updates, new articles, podcasts, uh, reviews, and join the Lorehaven Guild and talk more about the complex issues like this one. Meanwhile, over in the comm station, we had a few notifications roll in, but for the sake of time, I will focus on one from one hero of the Guild called Blessed Artist H.W., uh, that hero loved last week's episode 176. I alluded to that one a lot more in this episode than I thought I would about those cultural oases. And uh, Ted Turno, my co-author for another book, uh, his new book, talking about oases of imagination. Uh, this hero said, quote, as someone who was raised in a very sheltered, almost no magic, limited allowed Disney movies, keep away from the world environment. I really appreciated this week's episode 176, Oasis of Imagination episode. End quote. Well, I appreciate that appreciation. Uh, Ted basically held a class. Uh, Marion, it's the craziest thing. We basically get all these uh, learned individuals into the studio uh, just to give us some free education. We basically get to audit their material. And in return, like, go get that book. Like, even the, even the big one, uh, my, my copy actually rolled in the day that we have released the episode. I'd already read enough of it and all of Ted's previous books to prepare, but definitely get to Oasis of Imagination, a free plug there for my brother. Next on Fantastical Truth, we hear a lot about evangelical bubbles, even on this podcast, even in this episode. People say that Christians ought not live in these kinds of insular spaces. Instead, we need to make better stories that help reflect our world and build those bridges with the neighbors. And some Christians, like our last guest in that last episode, encourage believers to plant oases of imagination to serve the common good. Well, what is the common good? Uh, not even J.K. Rowling and Megan Phelps Roper may agree with us on that one, but others entirely seem to put their own oases onto those armored platforms, and they roll around the territory, having themselves some culture wars, and they fire paintballs at their opponents. Are these our only choices as Christians? Must we choose between influencing mainstream culture versus owning the libs? So next week, I think we're going to explore that. It might be me. It might be me and Zach. Maybe we'll get a guest in here. We're going to explore the pros and cons and legit Christian alternative creative works that are kind of busting up uh, these two categories and going in a completely different and effective creative direction. Meanwhile, at Lorehaven, as in the Christian life, we are not fond of legalism. Don't do it. It's not great. 
Uh, Jesus spoke very clearly against it. Do not be a Pharisee. You can even be a Pharisee against Pharisaism if you're not careful, but also be careful about fandoms. It's a great thing, but there are trolls. There are bullies. There are the bad kinds of gatekeepers. Uh, There's all kinds of nastiness going on because the human heart has some nastiness mixed up in there, along with the common grace that God has given us. And especially, I would say, going out on a limb here with a hot take, avoid the sexual activism. Uh, Don't look to Tumblr or 4chan or Twitter or even the Harry Potter series to discover who you are. You have all you need to know who you are in the Holy Word of God. That's our hot take here at Lorehaven. We believe in God's word. So we're going to keep going back to that and appreciating where other people honor it accidentally as we continue to seek and find his fantastical truth.